that she wore. And I have a little painting started of this, and you will see it today. This is Rona in the classroom at the college on Tuesday of this week. And we started the class with gesture drawing. These here on the wall here and over here are one-minute drawings. And people ask me, why, why do you do that? You do that to warm up, and it's best if you stand up and do it. Get your whole arm into it. A gesture drawing, as you can see, is not about eyes, nose, and mouth. It's about the action. It's about what is the model doing? What is the model feeling? So you can see just these little scribble sketches, and this is not the only way to do gesture drawing. People also do them in little masses um, in, in different ways. But this is how we started the class on Tuesday with gesture drawing. Then after that, Rona posed, and um, I, of course, forgot my camera, but somebody took a picture for me so that you could see what she looked like. So it's <laughs> oh, yeah. And I have this sketch ready to go. I'm going to start this painting 
today. And I want you to know that this is watercolor. This is not the only way to paint watercolor. There are a hundred different ways to paint watercolor. But the way I'm going to start this particular painting is I'm going to paint the whole thing all at once. I'm going to put like, it's going to be like an underpainting. So I will, I will put color all over this sheet of paper, across her face, her hair, her clothes, everything. And what this is going to do for the finished painting is it's going to tie it all together because there's going to be a consistency throughout. Whereas if I paint this little spot and this little spot and this little spot, it might not hold together as well as it will with this face. So that's the way I'm going to start. And uh, sometimes I can talk while I'm painting and sometimes I can't. Another thing that I need to tell you is I do not start and finish a painting in an hour. I We'll work on several different things, some that are already started, this one that I'm just starting, because I just, I can show you a lot of techniques and a lot of processes, but I can't start and finish a painting in an hour. So we'll just hope that you learn a lot from what's going on. I'm going to remove these clips. Uh, this is 300 pound arches paper, and it's very strong, and I have the sketch of Rona already done on here for me. I draw in graphite. Usually when I have a model posing, I spend the first 20 to 40 minutes doing the drawing. And then I start to paint. And for a long time, I never painted directly from the model. I would always draw and then go home from, to the studio. But lately, since I've been working with the group in Gold Beach, we go there and we paint. So this is kind of fun. I always use the biggest brush that will do the job. Yes, Greta? Do you always paint vertically now? No. Um, I'm painting vertically for you. Um, often I do, not always. But for this process, you'll see why it works. So evidently you can layer watercolors like you do acrylics. And you can. Mm -hmm. You can put layer after layer. What, what we call glazing is the same in oil, acrylic, and watercolor. Uh, in watercolor particularly, you want the paint to dry to glaze over the top. But you'll see that I'm going to put a lot of different colors on all at once and let them mingle themselves. The more I can get the painting to paint itself, the happier I am. <laughs> very, very white skin and very, very black hair. And I'm thinking that this is going to be my highlight side and this is going to be my other side will be my shadow side. Um, <coughs> but I want these colors to run together. I want them to blend. And if something really makes me unhappy, I can lift watercolor. I've even been known to put it in the bathtub and scrub it off. Watercolor always dries lighter than it is when you put it on. So if you put it on and it's the perfect value, then it's too light. <laughs> you want to go darker. <laughs>
have to paint under the clips. Oftentimes, I like to paint clear to the edge of the paper. Um, sometimes when I'm framing, I'll do what's called floating, mm -hmm. which means that you actually, the viewer can see the edges of your paper, and it's mounted on a, uh, a mat board of some, some kind, and um, you can see these deckled edges. I like the, I like the deckled edges of the watercolor paper. streaks in here I don't like. That's probably because I didn't activate my paint enough. You need to... I never throw watercolor paint away, but I, and I do let it dry, and when it dries, sometimes you need to, to reactivate it by just stirring it together, and I probably didn't take the time to do that today like I should have. That's why I'm getting those little granule pieces that are making marks, but I'll see if I can just brush them out. You gotta finish painting. Finish painting <laughs> just as I. <laughs> okay, now I'm just gonna look at it and see if there's anything that I really don't like. Um, it, it doesn't matter. I'm gonna paint back into this probably several times before I'm finished. But I'm thinking that this this kind of a base is gonna hold it together. I don't, I don't worry about anything like this. That's kind of interesting to look at. I may, I may leave that there. I may paint it out at a later time. It doesn't matter to me that part of her jeans are pink and part of them are blue. But I, you know, I have a feeling that paintings lead you. Um, they almost never turn out the way I think that they're going to when I start because they have different ideas about what's happening than I do. Okay, Garetta, I'll tell you my colors. And <coughs> because I'm not a person that memorizes a lot of names, and the minute you start telling me 10% of this and 30% of that <laughs> to make that, I just Thank goodness. go bananas. <laughs> so the colors that I have <coughs> used here are, um, I'm going to catch that drip right there, are Opera and Aurelian, which is a very pale yellow, and I used a little uh, quinacridone uh, uh, burnt orange, or quinacridone gold, I'm not sure which. Uh, the jeans are a cobalt blue. Cobalt blue is a very clear blue. And then I had a little bit of Andrew's turquoise that I put on her shirt, which is a very much a turquoise shirt. Okay, so that's how I'm going to start this painting. I'm going to put it aside, let it dry a little bit, and I'll get it back out and work on it while I show you some other things. 
Do you always have a highlight side and a shadow side? In Not in the real world. But it, for painters, it's very helpful. Uh, in here, we've got light coming from every place. If you can have a highlight sh side and a shadow side, it, uh, it, it makes your pain painting much more interesting to look at. But most places we are, there's, unless you've set up a light source, which is a good thing to do if you have a model, is to set up a light source. I'm just going to lay this down on the floor and let it dry a little bit. And we'll go back into it, and I'll show you something else that I've been working on. Um, I may come back to this two or three times, this little hot and spicy color that I was talking about. I had visions of painting for you a group of ribbons with this technique. And I tried a few of these at home, and I decided this is just too time-consuming to do in front of somebody, but um, but I can show you the technique without working with the ribbons. And I'll show you the way I drew the ribbons is with two pencils taped together, and I just did things like this to make nice ribbon patterns. So just two pencils together, mark with both of them at the same time. But I will be able to show you the technique, and so I'll show you a little bit of this, and then I'll go back to another painting, and then I'll come back to this. So we'll be going back and forth. And I did print out for you the colors that I'm using, the color combinations that I'm using. And this, this little experiment or exercise, um, is, what it's doing is creating a bridge between your complementary colors. Um, I, I'm sure most of you are aware that the opposite colors on the color wheel are complements. A lot of blank places out there. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, the opposite of red is green. The opposite of violet is yellow. Um, the opposite of blue is orange. And to make these transitions, when you use complementary colors, you're, uh, this is what we see in nature. And it's, it's going to make your paintings improve. I also, when I want to dull a color, and when we dull a color, we're talking about the intensity. There are three factors that we want to think about in color. Number one is hue. And hue just simply means the name of the color, red, yellow, blue, green, and orange. I've seen different definitions for hue, but more of them say it's the name of the color. The next factor that, and maybe more important than the color, is the value. And when I talk about value, I don't mean how much it's worth. I mean the blacks and whites and all the grays in between. And color has value. So if you have a color that has eight, a painting that has eight colors on it, and they're all the same value, you're going to have a boring painting. You need a variety of values. The third thing, and this is a, this is a little harder for most of us, is the intensity. And the intensity is either the brightness or dullness of the color. And in order to dull the co color down or neutralize it, you put the opposite color on the color wheel. If you want to neutralize a green, you add a red. If you want to neutralize a lavender or a purple, you add a yellow. So anyway, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I've got some of these to hand out. Um, Maxine, you want to just pass some of these around? And <laughs> these are the colors. I'm going to start with number one. And I'm going to work with um, cobalt blue. Alizarin Crimson, Brown Matter, and Copper Kettle. And I have to write all of these down because I never remember it. But I'm just going to show you how you would move from one of these colors to another. Because what you're doing is you're going from a blue to a orangey color, which is opposite colors. So let's find the cobalt blue here. And then the next color that I want is a lizard crimson. And I have my palette marked so I can find the colors. A lizard crimson is a warm red. The next color I'm going to go to is a brown matter. And brown matter by Holbein is not it's a very warm, almost red. And 
then the copper kettle is, I love these names. I've got copper kettle and lucky penny. <laughs> What brand has got copper kettle? I've never heard of that. Um, it's Cheap Joe's. It's probably an American Journey. Um, and also know that an alizarin crimson with Windsor Newton or American Journey is not the same color as it is with a Holbein. Um, it's really, really very, very difficult to get good colors because it, it's not always what you think it's going to be. Okay, what I want you to see here is how I have moved from a cool a, a blue into almost an orange color just with this transition. The next one I'm going to use is Windsor Yellow, Quinacridone Gold, Copper Kettle, Brown Matter, however you say that word, Violet. If somebody knows they can help me. Yeah. Thank you. The old indigo. <laughs> Mineral violet and ultramarine violet. <laughs> I could never say it either. <laughs> Sometimes I have trouble with words, especially if I'm excited. Okay, Windsor yellow. Quinacridone gold. I love the quinacridone colors. They're wonderful. And I'll go into the copper kettle. Brown matter. Violet. Mineral violet. Um, that's my whole body. This is actually a new palette for me because since I've been working with, with colors, uh, with color theory, I've been paying more attention. This is my old palette and I stand by and I know where everything is on it. But um, it's a fairly new palette since I have been working so much with color lately since I've been teaching this color theory class. Okay, see how we have easily moved from the from the. Uh, to the complements on both of these, mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. through these stages or bridges. I don't see a green. Pardon me? I don't see a green. I don't have any green up here. <laughs> but if it, if it, if it looped, it would. Well, that, that reassures me a little. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't paint any green. Okay, I'll do some more of these later um, it, because I think they're interesting to look at and I think it's, it's fun to see how colors work. If you loop the ends, it would be. Yeah, the ones on the end. The ribbon kept going. <laughs> okay, this is a painting that I have been working on. It's not finished. This is, again, uh, Rona in her zebra de dress. Um, and I started this painting the same way that I started the one that I just showed you by going over the, no, that's not true. I started this dress by putting in the stripes on the dress with India ink and a brush. And I have one here that I have, have started, which is the same image. I always, I always trace the image so that I can do it again. And for my purposes here today, I wanted to have more than one method of doing things so that you will learn different ways of working. 
This is a brush and ink, her hair, her eyebrow, her eyebrows and eyelashes, and the stripes on her dress. This is two different kinds of paper. This is hot press paper, and hot press paper is very, very smooth. Cold press paper has a tooth. Hot press paper makes a nice crisp line with the ink, whereas the ink on here goes down in the valleys of the paper and you don't get the crisp line that you want. This will take the paint better. The paint slides around on this for me. So there are advantages and disadvantages in both. One method that I often work in is a mixed media where I will do ink and then watercolor and then colored pencils on top. You can, uh, you can do pastels on top as well. So this is, this is my start of a, a watercolor and ink painting of Rona. And I think that I'm going to work <clears throat> in a different way on this hot press paper that I worked on here. And that is I'm going to paint the hood in instead of putting the, the background in. I'll have two different paintings. And, and We'll see how something works better one way or another. And I have written down the colors that I want to use on this, and I have this little pair. Um, I did take a class from uh, Nancy Collins in Mendocino, and she's one of the people that I learned a lot about color in. But this is just a little red pair, and it I have written down a map for myself so that I knew what colors I put where because oftentimes I do things like this and then I get home and I said, what, what did I put on there? Um, so this is quinacridone red and then this is brown matter. Um, this is quinacridone red again and this is Indian yellow over here. And I like that hot color. So I'm, gonna, I'm going to paint Rona's uh, headdress which goes down the back of her dress in these colors on the hot press paper and we'll see if I can control it because it does tend to slide around on that hot press paper. Anybody questions? I had a question about, about the ink. You said you put the ink on and you put watercolor over it. Mm -hmm. I tried that and I, my ink was supposed to be permanent. <laughs> but I did zebras and I, and I did all the stripes and all mm -hmm. that and then I put a little color like Watch your labels because there are water soluble inks, there are inks that are permanent. So read the labels because that's so much work to, and, and, it, and it will all wash away. Um, but you can see on this, I did the ink first. This looked exactly like this when I started. And I put all those watercolor washes over. And notice how I tried to get <coughs> some warm and cool. This, this reads as a black and white striped dress. But there's golds and pinks and blues and all kinds of other colors to get your, your warm and your cool colors into that. But oh, I, I feel so bad because I know how much work that is. And then it, it all goes away. Another fun thing to do with ink is there are inks, this ink, I can dilute with water and make grays. And some of my students, one of their projects is to work with ink in the, the darkest value is the ink straight, and then they have a little pan of water, make it lighter and lighter, and they make a, a black and white gray. Yes. And after it's been diluted and dry, then it is still permanent. Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, I thought these were dry, but I, I guess maybe I got too anxious. And Probably it wasn't a matter of being dry. It was probably a matter of the ink was not uh, a permanent ink. Would be my guess. Not seeing, you know, not seeing what you do did. But I could, I could put water all over this. I could put this in the bathtub. I could shower it, and it would never go anyplace. shops or, um, you know, they're not very good for picture framing. I don't like acrylic because I think it scratches and it distorts the color. But um, but for a lightweight drawing board, it's great. Yeah. 
it's not as it's not as firm as the Dave Ward or some of the others, but but it, it works really well. Okay, look at my notes again for my color. And <coughs> I might go to a little smaller brush. I use both round brushes and flat brushes in my painting. If I could hold them all in my hand at once, it would be ideal. Uh, find my colors. Here's the quinacridone red. In this palette, I squeeze the watercolor paint. Instead of down in the well, I squeeze it kind of a across the top. And then when I activate the paint, I kind of just pull it down. So I have a little well of color. Mm, good idea. Good tip. What would that color be comparable to? Like a Windsor red? Or do you um, no, it's not. I, I, I've used Windsor red. This is almost a red orange. Uh, you'll see when I put it on. But it's transparent as opposed to cat red. Oh yeah, it's very transparent. Okay. Probably in my next layer of paint, we'll put some shadow shapes in here, but right now I'm just mostly interested in getting the color on. I don't, I want to work quickly enough because I want these colors to blend and I don't want any hard edges. When I'm going to stop, you first put your paintbrush in your mouth, <laughs> then you run a bead of water here. That will stop it. Right there. The paint will only go where the water is, so it's going to just bleed down here, and I will not have a hard edge. But I want to get in there with my next color, which is the brown matter, which is a, I don't know why it's called brown, because it's mostly red, uh, brown matter. And this is not a staining color you use? No. Uh, here it is. This is the color I want. This is whole bound brown matter. And I'll show you in a few minutes, if you remind me, the difference between whole buying brown matter and Windsor Newton. You will <coughs> see very definitely that colors are not the same in different brands. You see, this dried so fast, they should be just blending together. I'm going to have to go back in with that red so that, so that the colors go together themselves. This is this is my problem with with the hot press paper is it just slides all over the place. But that's good when you're trying to blend colors. Yeah, it? it is. That was a dry sponge, I take it. Yeah, <laughs> it was. <laughs> See this this hot press paper, I fight it. it it, uh, particularly when I'm working upright like I this. I was going to say, if it was laying down, it'd be a lot easier. If it was laying down, I would be able to have more control over it. Do you ever do that? Yes. But I didn't think you could see what no. I was, was doing if I was laying it down. Yeah. And this is not working real well for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is not working on a vertical at all. I, I'm going to have to paint it uh, laying down, so uh, we'll, we'll just do something else for a while. Don't fall asleep. <laughs> Me? But Sylvia can put direct her camera, even though it's lying down. And yeah. And, uh, and get right on top of it with the camera and they can watch it there. Okay, well, let me see what else I have to do here and then, and then if we need to get back to it, I'll be happy to do that. I was going to show you the difference in different brands of paint. I have a 
brown matter by Holbein here, and I have a brown matter by Windsor Newton, and I probably had some Windsor Newton on that brush. I'll, I'll get a different brush because I want you to see the difference. But brands of color are not the same. Oh. Very, good. very different. And I have been very very, very disappointed. Um, like, I, alizarin crimson is one of my favorite colors. And um, I bought an American Journey alizarin crimson, and it's not a color I like at all. Okay, let's, um, let's bring this one back and see what we can do on her. Accent? No, she sp her native language is Turkish. Uh, she speaks beautiful English and uh, and has had a lot of English in school. It's very much required in the rest of the world that the, the children learn English. But she had not done a lot of verbal English. It was more written English. And so coming here, she's getting the verbal. <coughs> she's getting a California accent. <coughs> Not a British accent. <laughs> Not a British accent, no. Okay. Let's see what we want to do here. Um, your student was standing next to me last night. I didn't realize she was your student. Um, and she was saying that she was Italian, and I introduced myself as Gareta Lamore. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that was, that, was, uh, that was Serena, the one from, from Italy. And she was, she was very, very anxious to talk to that woman. And they did. They mm -hmm. were jabbering yeah. away in Italian, and she I just nodded. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's, uh, that's Serena. I do not use black watercolor paint. I only use mixtures of colors. If I want a black, a real black, I'll use my three darkest colors, like maybe alizarin crimson and a viridian and an ultramarine blue. And I may go over the same area several times. Um, I don't, I don't like black watercolor paint. I think it, it looks matted and dull, and looks like you have a hole in your paper. So Rhone has very, very dark hair. So I'm going to lay some colors in here. Uh, this is a very dark blue. I don't remember which one, and a little Payne's gray. And I, I used to use Payne's gray, and then I stopped using it, and now I've added it back. So it's one of those colors that is kind of come and gone on my palette. But I'm gonna I'm gonna lay some tones in here in her hair and these are gonna be a very dark blue and I may, you know, run some other colors into them or um, a little high over my head too. kind of light highlights in the front of her hair where the light is coming down on her hair. And I'll run this blue-black color right into that. her hair is brown, but to most of us in America it's black because it's very, very dark. 
But I, I want to show these, these highlights. If you were doing this particular painting at home, would it be vertical? Um, the first, who, who asked me? I did. Okay, the first coat would, would be vertical. Um, later on, I would probably tip it down a little. There are some things that I want to run and some things I don't, and, and particularly when I was working with that hot press paper, that was just not working at all in a vertical position. probably would not put these features in quite so quickly if I was working at home. Um, I probably would wait on that a little bit later, but I want you to see some of my, some of my end results, so I may be working in a different order than I normally would. I tend to work all over and not finish any one thing, just work every place and kind of build it up in layers one after another. That's probably better, isn't it? It, it is. Is mm -hmm. that just to let it dry? Um, mm -hmm. No, to... Because what you put next to something, one, one color next to another changes it, it's important to work all over. If you, if you, if you paint a face or an eye and you, you, you finish it, whatever you put next to it is going to change that. So to me, it's better to do the whole thing all at once and just build it up slowly. So I'm getting balance. Yes, yes. For shadow shapes in faces, I tend to go, go toward the lavenders or the greens uh, or the blues rather than to the browns. I don't go to earth tones usually for shadows in skin tones. And with Rona, I'm going to use a little lavender violet color. She has a strong shadow shape down the side of her nose. And of course, I can see the shape of the lower lid here. And she has a shadow shape under her eye and around the nose. color is mineral violet. And I'll put some, I, I repeat colors in different places, like if I'm using a color in a particular place, I'll, I'll put some in the hair or someplace else. <coughs> that keeps the eye moving. Yes. It also, it's for continuity, you know. Yeah. yeah. Good. <coughs> Put some color in her face, which she has. It's, I'm not adding a little blusher, she, she very definitely has a high color in her face. I keep it soft, and then I can always go in and add more later, building it up again. see a reflected light on the shadow side, which I try to put in by the wrong color. Right along here I can see reflected light from something that'll make this kind of glow. And then I can just take a bead of water 
and run it right in to meet the other colors that I have. in that she has a naturally upturned mouth. Most of us, when we are relaxed, our mouths turn down. It's just, it's just normal. You have an upturned mouth. Naturally. Ooh. Ooh. I don't know the young man's name. Oh. Yeah, Matthew? Yeah. Um, I, that's real fortunate because I, I look around the room, myself included. I mean, when you're smiling, your mouth turns up. But most of us, when we relax, don't have that. And, and Matthew does and Rona does. like this I would work on for a long time. Um, I might start out by covering the whole watercolor paper, but then after that it's, it's kind of slow. I want to lay in some shadow shapes down here on this arm. I don't want a hard line there. I want, it's okay to have a hard line on this side next to her shirt, but on the other side, I want a soft line. So I will just simply take some water and a brush and just touch that side and it will blend in so that you don't know where that shadow starts and where it stops, just with a bead of water. Another way to do it is to go in with more pigment. But you want to soften that because you don't want hard lines. So, some places you want hard edges and some places a variety is what you want. Another thing that can, can help your painting is to paint the negative space. And this would be the positive shape here. This is the negative space out here. So if I want her face to pop out or her hair, I might put in a really dark, darker area behind there. When you paint around something, it pushes, pushes it forward. I'm kind of liking some of the varieties of colors that I'm getting in here, so I don't want to go too fast. And, and, and block out all the good stuff that I have. But these jeans are really, really dark. That's like your, your portrait on the wall. Yes. Okay. Uh, now that background was done the same way this one. This, this, by the way, was a model in Gold Beach. Cool. And she, she is in the Del Norte Orchestra, and she does practice the violin for hours a day, even though the, I believe she was, I don't want to misstate her age, but I think she was late 70s or early 80s. And she thought that she could pose for us with this violin. In, I'm sorry? Just a kid. Just a kid. <laughs> she thought she could pose with this violin in her hand because she does practice for hours a day. But practicing and moving is different than sitting and holding. So she lasted, oh, you know, five minutes with that violin. <laughs> And I got a really good drawing of her right away, and the violin was so awful. I mean, it was just <laughs> terrible. 
So I had to go home and redraw the violin completely to get it. <coughs> well, you had perspective her is, and everything else to yeah. deal with. Um, her name is Edith, and she lives in Gold Beach. So that means she can use her to practice? Um, I don't know. I just know that Liz James told me that she was in that orchestra. Yeah, they, they meet every Monday night at the church in... in um, isn't, the, isn't that the orchestra that Liz James is in? Yeah. Okay, th well, she told me that yeah. she, she was in that orchestra. Three or four hours every Monday night. She's still practicing, huh? Hmm? She's still practicing. And she practices. Wow. Perfect by then. <laughs> you may have it perfect, but if you don't keep practicing, it won't stay perfect. It's like drawing and painting. Like the doctor. You've <laughs> got to keep doing it. Keep working it. Is Liz James still painting? Yes. Liz James is wonderful. Another thing Liz James is doing is critique. You, um, they meet on the first Friday of the month at Pelican Bay Art Association. Uh, she charges $10 for a critique. You can take one or 10 paintings into her, and she can just zero right in on everything. She's just so good. I admire her a great deal. there's a seam in her pants that I can see. So I want that to be a hard edge. But right down here, I don't see it anymore, so I want to soften that. So I'm going to run some water right in there. Or I can run some more color in here. <coughs> and soften this edge here. some shadow shapes in here underneath the fingers. This is very, very dark in here. Did you take a snapshot of her and then have it blown up? Um, I didn't, somebody had a, a, a friend of mine had a camera in the classroom that day. I had forgotten to take mine. Uh, I didn't blow it up, but I tell you what I do sometimes is, what I did blow up is a zebra dress. I, I did blow that up and trace it. I did not try to draw all those, but I didn't do a very good job of tracing, and then after I had them all traced, all my lines were wrong and wiggly, and I had to just redraw. I redrew as I was painting with the, with the brush. But um, sometimes when I'm doing something like this, I'll take a, a Xerox copy in black and white, and that gives me my value changes. And I may put it X right from corner to corner. Some people use a grid. It never works for me. It makes me crazy, all those little squares. <laughs> but an X across it will show me <coughs> what goes in what quadrant of the paper. And if I can get that right, then I can pretty much work it out. Nothing on this painting is finished. It's, I just keep moving around from one place to another. 
there's a wonderful glow down her left side. Right here? I think I'm not going to... From the face on down, mm -hmm. it's just glowing. Um, I think I'm probably not going to change that, Greta. I'm not going to make that blue jean blue. I think because, and and here, this is what we call the happy accidents. You know, you you, do, you get things like that, and then you just have to be aware enough to leave them and and let them be. And I will on that because I, I like I like what's happening there. Nobody's got up and left. <laughs> well, anybody who is on a time clock can be excused and I won't be offended because, because I, I am over the time. Well, I'm fascinated and grateful that you're staying. Yes. Thank you. was talking a minute ago about <coughs> this glow that, that goes all through the whole figure. Another mm -hmm. important thing to do is not just the, the highlight side, but the shadow side to kind of tie all your shadows together. If you can connect all of those, and of course one of my jobs is simplifying because I tend to want to paint every eyelash, mm -hmm. and if I can just not do that, if I can just paint less, Less is more, but it's hard for me to do. But what I'm going to do here is maybe get some color coming down this side. musicians practicing at my house. What instrument? Um, two violins, one cello, and one viola. Oh, I'm so jealous. <laughs> Why don't you come? <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. We're, it's going to be at the Lutheran Church tonight at 7 o'clock. Mm -hmm. And um, we usually meet at the other church, but they couldn't accommodate us on a... I drive by Braille. Oh. <laughs> I drive by Braille. I understand. Is your map in Braille? take you home with me, Coretta, but I wouldn't bring you back. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> to go and I'm just real curious what are you going to do with the right side of the right I mean the, the right side of the painting there on the arm are you going to do more on the skin or the background the answer is I don't know okay <laughs> good enough thank um, you so much the
lovely thing is that you can see it on a video anytime. Come back. Yeah. And, yeah. And Sorry. Um, she finishes it enough. <laughs> I probably will not get that far on this today. I, I, I probably won't. But it's, it's kind of like I make decisions as I go along. Um, like I made a decision to put this, this shadow. I saw just a faint image of this shadow, and I thought, oh, I'll just put in a wild shadow in there. And then after I put it in, I wasn't sure whether I liked it or not. But, you it's know, lovely. You, you try something and it either Ooh. works or it doesn't. And it, I always tell my students, it's just a piece of paper. The biggest problem is when <laughs> something gets so precious to you that you can't take a risk, then you kind of stop learning and stop experimenting. But you do need to, you know, constantly try something new. It may work, it may not. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm not sure what I'm going to do with that today. I'm working with two different brushes at once because I don't want to clean my brush. So I have a dark blue color and a red violet color that I'm running together and I'm just going back and forth between brushes so that they can blend together. And I even need another brush for another color. Here again, I'm using these hot and spicy colors to uh, mm -hmm. brush in the mouth that has the color or the brush in the feelings? <laughs> <laughs> no, the feelings. <laughs> Saliva blue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ew. But you can see how when you let those colors blend themselves, it, cre it creates a really alive, vibrant color. You know, there, there are certain colors that you put them in your mouth. They're yeah, uh, the cadmiums are really dangerous. And cobalt? Um, I don't know about cobalt. I know cobalt's a mineral, but I don't know whether it's dangerous or not. I, I've heard the cadmiums are terrible. But I didn't put the brush in my, I mean, the the paint in my mouth, just the, just the brush. Just that lead paint kind of Yeah. <laughs> there you go. I think it's in Britain that they're no longer permitting them to even uh, sell cobalt. Blue I, I cobalt think that's products. true here in California. Yeah, mm -hmm. quite here too. Yeah. Wow. Oh boy. When it's gone, it's gone then. Now, oh, well, you know, they took mangane manganese blue away. Mm -hmm. There's no law on manganese, but cobalt would be. Yeah. Can you still buy it in Oregon? I don't know. How about mail order? Well, see, that's I don't I don't know the answer to that. You know, maybe it, it's the state of origin, but I don't quote because I don't know. I just I just have heard that in California they're no longer selling cobalt. Hmm. I'm a little 
I know. Well, you know, people have asked me why one size tube of paint is $25 and the other one is $3.98. And the reason is, if it's cobalt, it's a mineral that's mined, and if it's a, a sienna or something like that, it's dirt. You know, <laughs> it's what's in it. <laughs> And that's why if you, uh, you know, now they can mix any color to paint your house. You just go in. And if they are mixing, a, they can get the same color by a sienna of one of the earth colors as they can by some of these more fugitive colors. Boy, can you tell the difference after it's been out in the sunshine. Really? Do they use the earth base or the more fugitive colors? Does it not hold its color? Or? Yeah, the, the blue, anything with the blue in it is going to fade right out of the mix. You do excellent with detail with all these in front of people. I love the details. <laughs> I really do. And uh, she doesn't even know we're here. Yeah, she's yeah. <laughs> crazy. That's funny. Until we interrupt her. No, no that, I don't mind. I don't mind questions. I feel like more than me coming here and you watching me paint a picture that our demonstrations are our education. And mm -hmm. I'm a teacher. You know, so <laughs> Thank I, you. I, I feel like that's that's what it's for. Although I love to just watch sit and watch somebody paint, but I always try to think of something that's gonna you know, that you can take away and add to your own painting. Mm -hmm. And I never ever stop learning. This September I'm scheduled to have a landscape painting class with Don Andrews in Gold Beach, which absolutely terrifies me because I don't paint landscapes. <laughs> Um, and if I do, I mean, I can paint flowers or leaves or these kinds of things. I zoom in on something. Uh, I don't, I mean, the whole, although I can paint seascapes, so I don't know what that's about, but landscapes I haven't painted. <laughs> okay. These shoes are kind of fun. They have a little, little um, pattern in them. Uh, now that's just one leg down, the other is underneath. Right? Yes. Yeah, this is this is her knee here. Okay. And she's sitting on it. And this is this is her leg coming down and this is her foot. I'll I'll get this this shoe in here and then you can tell what I'm doing here. It's really only our teachers that have the courage to get up here and give a demo. Well, you know, I think there's always the fear that you know, you'll get up and do something stupid or um, or, or everything you paint will be awful. I mean, I think we all have those fears. But, uh... When Julia Child dropped the big fish on her cooking show on television, everybody just thought that was endearing. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this will have many, many more layers of paint on it by the time I'm finished. And hopefully I won't go too far, but you can see this, this painting here. I, I do like details, but then I try to leave some things to the viewer's imagination. Now the decision is the soul is here, and so I need some kind of a shape under there, but I don't want to make it too strong because I I like that pinky color that goes all the way through, so I'm going to try to make this real subtle so you can just see where the sole of the shoe is, but it doesn't take away that, that continuous color that 
rides through the whole painting. Just a suggestion of, of the pattern, you know, she's at heel, does it look? You told me not to get that shot of you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> can we edit that? <laughs> Are those red? Pardon me? Are those shoes red? No, they're black and white little checks. Oh, okay. Little, little checkerboard okay. shoes. Yes. Uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, too late. <laughs> she bent over. I kept trying to get <laughs> You didn't move fast enough. <laughs> See, I'll make it your fault instead of mine. <laughs> but I really didn't want that in the video. Now, when a shoe is, is checkered like that, can you fudge and make that into like a solid color? or? Oh, sure. You know what? You can do anything you want to. It's your paper. <laughs> yeah. That's right. You can, and and if if something isn't working for you, you can change it. Yeah, I'd be afraid it would cause to call too much attention to it. Well, and it, and it might. And mm. sometimes if you if you do something, the eye is going to go where the greatest contrast mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. So wherever you have your lightest light and your darkest dark, that's what you want your viewer to look at. And so that's that's your focal point. And if I do something real cutesy down here. Then, then maybe everybody's going to look at this shoe and not look at this face. Mm -hmm. So you do have to be careful of things like that. And if, if that happens, if it gets to be too much of an attention getter, then just wash some of it out. I think I'm about to clean up my toys and go home. Thank you very much. <laughs>